Hi, before I get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Chris Bell. I have a master's degree in IT with a focus of web design and database administration. I've been working for my father's company for about 15 years, growing, maintaining, and optimizing our company website to show up in Google. And I started with Bitcoin in about the middle of 2017, and I thought it was a joke. And then I finally got into it. I started reading about it. And as I read about it, I started to realize this is going to be a big disruption. First book I read was Cryptocurrencies 101. His main thought here is don't be stupid. Mastering Bitcoin and the Internet of Money, both written by Andreas Antonopoulos. This is a pretty easy read and you can definitely learn a lot about Bitcoin and the blockchain and how it operates. This is a very technical book. I don't recommend it unless you have some programming knowledge. It's also pretty expensive. Digital Gold. This is also a pretty easy read. It's more of a novel style. It talks about um, how Satoshi Nakamoto got started back in early 2009. How he was involved with a few other people in the very beginning. How mining got started and how people were actually downloading the nodes onto their own computers. And some really technical stuff, but it doesn't get too technical in here and it definitely doesn't go over your head. So uh, it talks about Silk Road too, which is pretty interesting. How they were selling all kinds of different drugs and he was using the government tour program uh, protocol so that he could be completely infamous and he was bouncing around from all these different places and it looked like he was in a different area than he actually was when he was selling these drugs online. And of course, blockchain basics. The blockchain is how Bitcoin operates. It uses public addresses that are very, very, very long that are encrypted so that my address will send something to your address, which is blah and it sends it to a long blah. But that public address is kind of like an email address and it's out there, it's public, and all of the transactions that happen off of my long address are encrypted into the blockchain forever. So when you don't know that much about Bitcoin and you don't know that much about programming, it may seem like it's completely anonymous, but it is not technically anonymous. My address attached sort of to my name or my area, the IP address and everything can kind of be tracked back to me. It's not completely anonymous. So remember that. Your address is your address and you will continue using it throughout time. So a couple more things. This video will discuss how Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Dogecoin are, I won't talk about mining, that's a completely different subject, but I just want to talk about how these coins actually work. And I will not be talking about Ethereum tokens either. I will be talking about how Bitcoin and Ethereum, Litecoin, and Dogecoin are decentralized, how they're peer-to-peer, -peer, how they're borderless, and how they are encrypted. Not secure, how they're encrypted. So, let's get started. In order to understand decentralized, let's start with centralized. Centralized is, since the beginning of time, castles, um, Game of Thrones has a king of the castle that's centralized. Everything goes through the king. They have their castle, they have a moat around the castle for security to make sure that nobody can get into the castle except for the people who are already allowed. Everything goes into the very top and back down and it trickles down in a pyramid style. Facebook is centralized. All of the information goes into Facebook, it stays at Facebook, any changes to the Facebook server goes to the Facebook server, and then later on, if you want to ask for that information again, Facebook has it right there at that central location. So Facebook has millions, billions of users all down here, their central location is right here, people are continuously pinging that database, and then it comes back to them later on. So if you were to lose, break, or somehow just destruct your phone or your computer, you can go get a new computer, a new phone, sign into Facebook, and all of your information is there because it's at Facebook. Um, if you wanted to share a small database with your friends, so instead of thinking about a bigger database with customers and inventory and all kinds of crazy programming, think about a very small Excel sheet. If you and your friends wanted to share an Excel sheet together, you could put it up into Dropbox. Dropbox, once it's up there, all of the friends can then sign into Dropbox, make an adjustment to that sheet, sign back out, 
and then the next person that signs in can see those changes, make a few more changes, and then come back. Very simple. So let's say that I want to start my own database. And to keep things simple, I want you to be able to understand what decentralized is compared to centralized. So a decentralized database that I'm going to start in Excel. I create an Excel sheet, and I'm going to create an Excel sheet just for golf scores. So Chris, in the first row, Chris Bell, 95. I get a 95 on my golf score. I save that Excel sheet onto my desktop, and I know that it's safe. I know that it's secure. I know that the information is right. So what happens next? My friend comes in, Joe Schmo, and he gets a 90. So I have a 95 and he has a 90. He's in row 2 now, so I save his name, Joe Schmo, 90. I have a 95. I save that onto my desktop and I say, don't worry Joe Schmo, I've got it, trust me. Or I can upload it into Dropbox because he doesn't trust me. So I upload it into Dropbox so both of us can see it and it becomes central again. Or, if I hold it and I'm the only one who holds it, it's central because I have it. If 15 of my friends all want to be added to my Excel sheet, all of them would be added to it and I would keep it and it would be centralized on my desktop. Everything goes through me. In order to decentralize it, let's think about that now. I put my name on there. I save it onto my desktop. I put Joe Schmo's name on there. I make sure that everything is right, I look at it, I say, great, everything is right. My name is on there, your name is on there, now I'm going to send a copy to Joe Schmo. So now he has a copy on his desktop of the Excel sheet, and I have a copy on my desktop of the Excel sheet. And we agree on one simple rule. No changes can be made unless both of us agree. So every time a change needs to be made, we have to ask each other, is it okay? Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Thank you, make the change. So, a third person comes along. Her name is Sarah Smith, and she gets, I don't know, an 85. So we have a 95, a 90, and an 85. I add Sarah Smith to the database, or the Excel sheet. I save it onto my desktop. Before I say okay to Sarah, that everything is fine, I send a ping over to Joe Schmo. I ask him. Is everything fine if I add Sarah to this database? He says, yes, your name is still there with the same score. My name is still there with the same score. I'm going to add her name with the score that you put on there. Both of us have matching databases. Both of us save it, and we send a copy to Sarah. Now three of us have the same exact copy. So if that turns into 30, and then 40, and then 50, and then 300 million, that's going to be incredibly safe because all of those people have to agree before one simple transaction can be made. So this isn't something, the Bitcoin database, the protocol, is not something that's made for speed. It's not made to be a little bit better than Facebook's database or to be faster than Amazon. That's, that's not what it's about. It's about decentralized. It's about no person at the top, no king of the castle, no queen, nobody at the top, just all of us agree or all of us disagree. Okay, now everybody knows what decentralized is compared to centralized, which a very simple explanation is, everybody holds a copy. Not one copy at Facebook, every single user holds a copy, every single user asks for permission before any change goes. So, the next thing to do is, seems a little strange, what if the last person who got the Excel sheet decided, you know what, it's sitting right here on my desktop, why don't I manipulate it? Why don't I lower my golf score down and have the lowest golf score and just tell everyone to lower their Excel sheet? Well, what happens is, she will try to lower her score and she'll have to send a ping to every single other user who has the Excel sheet or a node on their desktop. And in order for everyone to agree, they have to look at their Excel sheet, see that she had an 85, and then see that she tried to lower it down to, I don't know, a 72, and everyone's going to say, nope, sorry, 
And then what happens is her Excel sheet gets disqualified completely, thrown in the trash. If she wants another copy, that's fine. She can download another copy from any one of the other users who has one right now. Anyone who has a, an OK Excel sheet or a node, she can download it. So in the Bitcoin blockchain, you can go to bitcoin.org and you can download one of the nodes, which is a giant list of all of the transactions that's ever happened on the blockchain in Bitcoin from day one until now. And you download that and you'll be a user, you'll be a node that helps the security and helps the assurity that everything is accurate because you'll be one more person that says yes and confirms yes when other people and hackers are out there trying to manipulate it because you know they will. So if you have 30 people with an Excel sheet and a hacker tries to break in and they break into my computer and they change my Excel sheet, it doesn't matter because there's 30 other Excel sheets that are all saying mine is gone, mine is trash now, someone got into it, doesn't matter, we're going to just give this person a new one. So what happens is there's something called a 51% attack. If it's possible that there are 30 Excel sheets and 16 of them, which is just over the 50% mark, 16 people all collude together and all decide, let's change all of our golf scores to a lower golf score and then all agree and we'll be 16 out of 30 and we'll then have full control and the other 14 of 30 will be just dropped out. That can happen and that would happen if it was possible. When you get beyond 30 Excel sheets, it gets very, very difficult. And when you're talking about money instead of golf scores, it also becomes a lot more difficult. So if you have millions of people who all say that I have a node, you have a node, you have a node, we all agree that this is right, and this is money that we're talking about here, not just a golf score, there's no way they're going to all collude together, 501,000 out of 1 million, and there's not even that, there's billions now. So it's not going to happen. This could happen in the infancy stages. So if you have a brand new coin that just came out, an ICO of some sort, and you want to invest into it, that is incredibly prone to a 51% attack. A 51% attack, again, takes more than half of the Excel sheets, matches them all up evenly, specifically and perfectly, and then demotes and knocks out the rest of the Excel sheets and that becomes the full new blockchain, the new coin, and it is exactly right. So that can happen, you have to be aware of that. So a 51% attack on Bitcoin right now is just astronomical. What happens is from day one, which was 2009, until now, which at the time of this video is 2018 in June, uh, there is so many transactions that there is just no possible way. The longer that it builds and the more people that download that node and add into the security and the network of people that agree that this is just so secure, it cannot be stopped. Facebook is just one thing. It's a giant warehouse of servers and if someone breaks into that castle, they can just start doing whatever they want with all of that information. So if they're trying to break into the Excel sheets that all of us are holding on our individual computers, they would have to break into every single one of our computers, 51% of the computers, change them all identically, and then jump in, make another transaction and say, boom, this is the new Bitcoin ledger now, the one that says I have all the coins, and then it's just going to just drop off to junk. So that's where it would end. That's the only way that it can be hacked. Otherwise, the only thing that can be hacked in Bitcoin is individual nodes in which they become trash anyway. So, sorry Sarah, you tried to change your golf score, I'm going to show you a picture right now. It's just not going to happen because even with three people, me, Chris, John, and Sarah, 51% would have to be two of them out of three. And if Sarah tries to change hers and John and I say no, Sarah's Excel sheet goes down and we give her a new Excel sheet if she wants to be involved. That doesn't mean that her golf score goes away. That doesn't mean that your Bitcoins would go away. That just means that your node that you downloaded onto your desktop that you manipulated is no longer. So you just need to download a new one that shows how many coins you actually have 
not the manipulated version that you tried to change so that you would have more Bitcoin and someone else would have less. That's not going to happen. Everybody is going to agree, and when 51% of people agree, well, there's probably always about 2% that just get knocked off and they say, darn, I have to download a new one. They download a new one, they manipulate it, doesn't matter, gone. That, again, that doesn't mean their Bitcoins are gone. Their Bitcoins are still there on somebody else's ledger that is still secure, but their node has been hacked and it is gone. Okay, peer-to-peer -peer is a little bit easier to understand. A peer-to-peer -peer system is my hands to your hands, my phone to your phone. It's not my phone to the bank to you. So Venmo is a really quick and easy way to transfer money. It's as simple as a few clicks, you transfer the money, there's no fees. It could be argued that Venmo is better or worse, but it, it doesn't matter. Venmo is a central, again, it's very central. You put your bank account into Venmo and it, all of your information is there can be hacked. Uh, so when I send you money from my Venmo account, it's coming out of my bank into my Venmo account to you and then from you into your bank account. I could also send money from my bank account so I can ping my bank account and send money to you. But Bitcoin is more of a cash system. I pull cash out of my bank account and I hand you cash. That's peer to peer. I hand my friend cash, I hand my mom cash, she hands me some cash, it doesn't matter, it's all cash, it goes back into the bank at some point. If you're illegal, you're doing illegal activities, and you want to be run on a cash basis, that's why criminals jumped right into Bitcoin, because it's a peer-to-peer, -peer. it goes directly to you, there's no other source to stop them, or regulate them in any way, or watch over them. There's no way, if you lose your 12-word password, there's no way to access it, there's no way, no one to ask, there's no email support, nothing. So, you download a wallet, and you have your wallet. It's just like a wallet in your pants pocket. I send you some Bitcoin, or I take money out of my wallet, I take Bitcoin out of my phone, I transfer it to your phone with a simple QR code, I take money out of my wallet, I hand it into your wallet. This is not money going into a bank account or a third party or any kind of central authority and then coming back to you, like Venmo for instance. Venmo goes into my bank or from my bank into my Venmo over to you. There's no fees, but that's still a central authority that could be hacked, so you got to be careful about that. Uh, I have a thing here that says techterms.com defines a peer-to-peer -peer network. In a P2P network, the peers are computer systems which are connected to each other via the internet. Files can be shared directly between systems on the network without the need of a central server. So, there's that word again, central versus decentral. The entire thing going on here with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, the craze, isn't the up and down, the volatility. It's decentralized. It's something new. It's something that hasn't been here before. There's no king of the castle. So remember that, it's peer-to-peer, -peer. it's just cash. Someone's just dropping cash out and people are fighting for it. That's what the mining is all about. The, the Bitcoins are just dropping every 10 minutes and people are just fighting for it. And the more crowded it gets, the more pigeonholed it gets and you just can't get it. Everyone's trying to fight for it so it gets more and more difficult. The machines are getting more powerful to pull those things in their direction. So it's turning into a bunch of mining pools and, and crowds doing it together, but it doesn't matter. The mining is different. The, ca the Bitcoins are peer-to-peer, -peer, directly from you to me into a different wallet. If you have a wallet on your phone, you have a 12-word password. If you get rid of that 12-word password, and I'm sorry, don't get rid of the 12-word password. If you download the app onto your phone, it's going to ask you for a new wallet. It's going to give you a 12-word password, and that 12-word password is what gets hashed into your Bitcoin address. So, you break your phone, get a new phone, download the app again, and you can quickly connect to your Bitcoins. Secondly, you can delete the app completely on your phone. Right after you create it, right after you get some Bitcoins from me, I transfer them over to you, you delete the app, get rid of it completely, download a second app, something that's completely different, a different Bitcoin wallet. 
use your 12 words. So instead of saying, I would like to create a new wallet, you say, I would like to restore my wallet. Those are the only two options when you download a new wallet for Bitcoin. So you restore your wallet, you type in your 12 words, boom, you've accessed your Bitcoin because everything is the online blockchain. When you have that 12 word password, it gets hashed into that very long Bitcoin address, which is on the Bitcoin blockchain online. And that blockchain writes down all of the transactions that you make with that address, whether you do it from this wallet or you throw away your leather wallet and you get a um, paper wallet or you throw away that wallet, you don't want it anymore, you want a money clip, it doesn't matter what wallet you have, all you need is that access. Once you have the access with the 12 words, you access your Bitcoin, which are online, you transfer them online to someone else's account, and again, peer to peer. Encryption is a word that people just relate to as secure. Oh, it's encrypted. Okay, yeah, well, you say it's encrypted, but I know somebody can hack into it. Um, encryption is different than secure. We were talking about secure earlier, how you have a castle and you need to secure it because there's things inside of it that you don't want people to see. So you put a force field around it and then someone breaks that force field. They hack into Facebook or they hack into Wendy's and steal all the credit card information and yada yada. So let's talk about encryption. And encryption is when you type in your password into any one of those websites. When you type your password into Facebook, it turns into dots or stars right away. You can't see it. So what happens is right before it goes into their database, which is just like an Excel sheet, it's just a little box in Excel, you put your name and they take your name and drop it into the first cell. They take your password, they surround it in parentheses and put SHA in front of it. Secure hashing algorithm. So your password that you typed in gets manipulated into this very long address and it gets put in as your password. So if somebody hacks into Facebook's database, again, they cannot see that column of passwords. So you take one of those and Bitcoin is 100% encrypted. There is no first name, there is no last name, there is no email. There's no phone number, there's no social security number, there's nothing. Like I said, you download a wallet, you get a 12 word password. You now have a 12 word password that gets hashed into a very long address and that's your address. You are now associated with that address. So there's a protocol out there right now in Ethereum that allows you to buy something kind of like a dot com. So when you buy something like chrisbell.com, you have an IP address. Before it was chrisbell.com, it was just 111.222.333, and I don't want to have to tell everyone to go to 111.222. blah blah blah. I'd rather tell them to go to chrisbell.com. So what they do is they take chrisbell.com, those specific characters, and point them to 111.222, and then they go to my website and it appears that you're on chrisbell.com but there's no such thing as chrisbell in those exact letters and then dot net and then dot all these different things so it goes to that address now you can get a dot eth not on godaddy that's different you can go to ethereum which is my my ether wallet dot com and you can buy your name dot eth so i already did chrisbell dot eth i have an ethereum address which is different than bitcoin you have an Ethereum address on the Ethereum blockchain, and the Ethereum blockchain allows you to take your very, very long address and associate it with your name.eth. So I can tell people now, please send me some money to chrisbell.eth. Instead, just like chrisbell.com goes to 111.da-da-da-da-da-da-whatever IP address, you have an Ethereum address and you have your name pointing to it. So that's going to be very interesting. Those are getting bought up like crazy. So I bought about 200 of them, all different famous names, all different types of things, so that I could have them and I put them back up for sale for about one ether. 
bought them. You can buy them for like six or seven bucks. You have to have an Ether account. Once you buy the Ether account, you don't even have to point it to anything. That's a separate transaction. So you buy it, you own it, and if you want to point it to an address, you can. So you can buy JustinBieber.eth and you can create an account and you can try to say that you are Justin Bieber and that you want some money to be sent to JustinBieber.eth and someone might send it to you or Justin Bieber might buy it himself and then end up creating one of the coins himself. If you have a Justin Bieber ICO and people want to try to put a bunch of money into Justin Bieber, they can send it directly to JustinBieber.eth and it will go point to that long address, that whatever address he has. And if he buys or if he ends up downloading a different Ethereum wallet and he has a different uh, password that turns into a different Ethereum address, he can then take JustinBieber.eth and point it to that address because the Justin Bieber name again is nothing. It doesn't it doesn't associate anything. It just points to the long address that you have, which you can then point to a different address if you ever want to. But that's encryption versus security. Security is very very different than encryption. Encryption is a bunch of numbers and passwords that cannot be seen by anyone. So a lot of these big companies that are central are kind of thinking about blockchain. They're kind of thinking about encryption versus security and saying, you know, maybe if Facebook just charged all of their users a dollar, they wouldn't have to ha spend all of that money on security. They could just encrypt the data. Instead of trying to sell advertising on their website, they could just, again, encrypt the data and allow the users to simply communicate with each other and send pictures back and forth as encrypted pictures. So if someone ever broke into their database, it doesn't matter. They wouldn't even have to secure it. There's no reason to secure it. It would be encrypted and nobody would be able to do anything about it. Just like the blockchain. Nobody can do anything about it. There are ways to maybe break some sort of encryptions and to turn encryptions around, but again, the fact that it's decentralized and it's encrypted, those two things combined just make Bitcoin so valuable and so it's such a big thing to have. So it's just created it, it, this, this valuable thing that people really, really want to have. And if you have one Bitcoin out of 21 million and 1 million of the 21 million Bitcoins just happen to go out of circulation because a bunch of idiots forgot their password, you have, there are billions of people in the world that could want one Bitcoin. One, soon one Bitcoin is going to be like one pound of gold. They don't even talk about pounds of gold anymore because it's so astronomically high in value. They talk about an ounce of gold. How much is an ounce of gold? People on TV are gold mining and they find this tiny crumbs of gold and like, oh my god, I have a bunch of money, and maybe an ounce, an ounce, it's like 1500 bucks. So same thing, Bitcoin, the decimals are going to start going like this and it's going to be a thousandth of a Bitcoin and you're going to have 20 of those. But really it's only 0 0.002 Bitcoin, but you have 20 out of a thousand. So, you know, they're just going to have different denominations and terms for it and that's how it's going to work. Okay, one of the final subjects I want to talk about is that Bitcoin is borderless. Um, we were just talking about how cash can be handed from me to you, from me to my mom, real quick, real easy. But um, tra sending sending Bitcoin to Cal I mean sending cash to California is pretty difficult. I can drive it to California in a suitcase, or I if I really want to be sketchy, I could probably mail it in a box and try to send it UPS red over to California, but. Um, Otherwise, you, can, you have to use a bank. You have to use some sort of central authority in order to access funds and send funds to another place, whether it's New Hampshire to California to Texas to Canada to China. It doesn't matter. Uh, cash is very difficult to send in another way. You have to use a bank account. So if you want to completely get off-grid and you want to go on to a cash system only and you want to go into Bitcoin, all you have to do is send a QR code or the long address. QR codes are very simple. It's like a barcode. Um, any, anyone who knows about barcodes for um, Amazon or something like that, you just type in a number and that barcode is that number. So once you have your 12 words and it gets hashed into your long Bitcoin address, it can easily be turned into a QR code or a barcode. 
Once you send somebody that QR code, all they have to do is scan it. And they say send money, 0.01 Bitcoin to this address, click done. Or I email you my very long um, number, my Bitcoin address, I send you that number and you send money to that public address. So these are public numbers that are being used. You have your private, your private number is the hash number that, that um, you hash that and you don't want to give anybody your private address, but that's another story. I don't even want to get into that. That's just too much. So the address that you have, you just send to somebody. You put it online. If you go to the very bottom of Bitcoin.com, it says, please donate to this address. You send money to that address and it, it's that simple. I can just send money and it's completely anonymous to them because all I am is a big 40 character of lowercase letters and numbers and I sent them some money so they don't know where it came from they might be able to somehow track down the IP address of, of an area that it came from but they can't see that I sent that money so it's actually pretty difficult for them to say thank you for donating money in simple as that the borderless part of it is like sending cash to Canada so if you had a friend or a relative or somebody that you wanted to send money to all you need is a Bitcoin address they don't need to set it up they don't need to buy any Bitcoin they don't need to use an exchange they don't have to have a bank account all they have to do is download an app and once they have that app and the 12 word password they didn't put their name they didn't put their number they didn't put a social security number a phone number an email nothing it says new wallet Thank you, here's your 12 words, don't forget the 12 words, and don't screenshot the 12 words like an idiot. Don't put them on your computer, save them in a safe place. 12 words, if you can, just remember them in your head, don't even write them down. There's ways to memorize things that are pretty simple, so look online about how to memorize 12 words, and trust me, there's some little techniques that you can use that are kind of cool to remember those words, and they call that a brain wallet. When you have a brain wallet, you didn't write it down anywhere. You don't need a safe. You don't need anything. Again, when you cancel that app, you just delete the app off of your phone. You don't want to get physically robbed from somebody. You don't want to carry a wallet around with you. You don't have to. Just have one address with your 10 Bitcoin. That's a lot of money right now. So you have 10 Bitcoin in one address that you have the 12 word password to. Just get rid of every device. Get rid of everything. Get rid of your wallet. All you need are those 12 words and you just have to download an app, restore wallet and boom, you have it. Do it in private. Do it somewhere where no one else is around that they can see it. Then take like a half of a Bitcoin, send it to another address and then download an app onto your phone and you keep a half a Bitcoin on you at all times. Just like taking money out of your bank account and putting it into your wallet. Except you have two wallets. You have a big wallet and you have another wallet so a lot of people are actually getting a little hardware wallet they're putting a bunch of Bitcoin on it and then they're going to a bank go figure how ironic going to a bank opening a self social security box and they have <laughs> they have their money back in the bank it's it's a joke it makes no sense because you don't even need that hardware wallet you download the hardware wallet and you have a 12 word password you don't even need it anymore you just wipe the device get rid of it, throw it in the trash, and as long as you have those 12 words, you can restore that wallet anywhere at any time. It's cash. It's all cash and it's all you. It's all up to you. You have that 12 word password, you lose it, sorry, you're out of luck. You will not ever be able to access those Bitcoins. And the funny thing is, you might know that long address that you have and it, you'll see it on the blockchain. You'll see your Bitcoin right there, 10 of them sitting in that address and you don't know the 12 words to access it you're out of luck there are plenty of bitcoins that are coming look it up google it and see how many bitcoins are actually out of circulation right now they're just stuck in a spot because people have lost their code there's no one to call there's no email support nobody so that is the bonus of a centralized system you can call facebook and say i forgot my password and they'll figure out a way for you to access your account if you lose your password in Bitcoin, you have lost access forever. So keep that thing safe. Do not put it online. Don't let someone else steal it. If someone else finds out that 12 word password of yours, they get access to your funds. So a lot of people are creating puzzles right now. You have a 12 word, you put one Bitcoin into this, this wallet of those 12 words. And if someone can figure out the crossword puzzle for all 12 words, the first person to figure out the 12 words can create that and use that 
password to send the coins away from them. So the first one to get to it is like a treasure hunt. The first person to get to those coins by figuring out what those 12 words are in order, boom, they got it. So there's a, a, someone creating these art, these pieces of art, and they're doing an entire painting, and they're hiding words inside of it and encrypting them a little bit too. So if you can figure out that puzzle, the Bitcoin are there for you, just there for the taking. So it's decentralized. It's peer-to-peer. -peer, it's borderless. And I'm about to talk about how it is encrypted. I know I made a quick mistake at the end there. I said that I was going to talk about encryption, but I already have, so I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, you just saw a quick image of Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and Litecoin all together on Block.io. That's a blockchain that shows all of the different um, cryptocurrencies, those three cryptocurrencies. Dogecoin is always included in the top few. So what happened was Bitcoin was created first, and there's 21 million that will be mined. Litecoin was created off of Bitcoin, which is a fork, and it has 84 million, so there's four times as many Litecoin. And then Dogecoin was created off of Litecoin, which is 100 billion created. And Dogecoin is the only one of the three that's actually going to have an inflation. It's going to have inflation of 5% per year, which means there will be 100 billion mined, which there already has been. And there's also already been three years worth of 5% inflation included. So there's an additional 5 billion 5%, but 5 billion right now, that have been included extra. So people are mining those extra inflated currencies. So your US currency right now, you know, there's a hundred billion dollars or a, or a trillion, whatever there is, a hundred billion US dollars out there, and then the government prints another billion that year, and then they print another billion the next year. So your dollar is worth a dollar, but there's more dollars in circulation, so it becomes worth a little bit less, which is why everything goes up in value over years one of the reasons why everything goes up over the years. Dogecoin is right there. It's going to be more of a tipping system. So you have Bitcoin, you might buy a house with Bitcoin later on, a few Bitcoin. And then you have Litecoin, you might buy a car with Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin because it's a little bit lower in value. And then you have Dogecoin, which you're going to tip with. Nobody wants to tip 0. .000001 Bitcoin to a you know for a restaurant. You might even use Dogecoin sooner or later when it's worth a dollar to pay for your food. 20 Dogecoin for $20 worth of food and you tip them a few dollars. You like, I mean, I have over a million Dogecoin right now. So the Dogecoin is just going to be huge because it's right there related. So everything I've already talked about between decentralization and encryption and you know peer-to-peer -peer and borderless, Dogecoin is right there. They have a huge following and a huge network and it looks kind of funny because there's a dog involved and everything, but the dog creates the network and they're also involved in volunteer programs and they volunteer for all of these different things and people join in and throw some money in there and they all communicate and everything on forums. So Dogecoin is quite big and I, I really recommend if you want to jump in and you don't want to buy a $7,500, it's June 2018, if you don't want to buy $7,500 Bitcoin right now and you don't want to buy over $100 uh, Litecoin, go for a .0035 Dogecoin, buy a few thousand of them and, and just you know hope that it's going to be worth a dollar someday because it could just skyrocket. And it's involved right next to Bitcoin and Litecoin all the time, which means Coinbase is probably going to eventually list Dogecoin when you, know, you have Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, which I think, ugh, I hate Bitcoin Cash, but I'll talk about that in another video. Uh, Litecoin and Ethereum. Ethereum is obviously giantly huge. Uh, they're creating apps and tokens and everything, so those tokens are incredibly scary. Do not buy tokens unless you understand what they are. Tokens are incredibly scary. I'm going to make another video very quickly about Ethereum tokens because I want people to understand how incredibly scary they are. They are not shares of a company. They are specifically not shares of a company because if they were shares of a company the SEC would regulate them. The SEC is looking into them to specifically see if they're asking to be shares of a company. So they're not. They're like tokens at an arcade. They're used at the arcade but they're not the company. Trust me, they're not. So I'm gonna make another video about that. If you have any information or any input please comment below. Uh, I'm gonna talk about infrastructure uh, the infrastructure is just growing, so all of the businesses that are jumping out of all of these places. If you think about back in the day when horses 
became cars. It wasn't like the first car was created and it started driving down mud roads that the horses used to travel down. There was all kinds of infrastructure that had to slowly happen over the years for it to actually start working. So Bitcoin is created, there's all kinds of businesses. There's first there's exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken and Binance and all these different places, Polynex, that are um, helping people get the cryptocurrencies. And then there's Changely and Shapeshift.io that are helping people exchange from the regular um, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dogecoin into other cryptocurrencies that are Ethereum tokens and all kinds of things like that. So there is so much more to talk about. Please let me know if there's something that you want me to talk about, and I definitely will. I told you about all the books that I've read, and I'm going to continue to read more. So I can't wait to talk about a little bit more of this, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. So please, please, please talk to me a little bit about this. And I'm sorry for the 40 minutes worth of information here, but I <laughs> there's so much to talk about. Good luck. Uh, like I said, if you are going to buy some Bitcoin right now, buy Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, and Ethereum. Do not buy tokens unless you understand what you're buying. Okay? Do not. Thank you.